I wanted to also mention that uh, tonight we're actually celebrating in some ways, uh, not, not that you're leaving or anything, it just, the, the career of a, a truly distinguished faculty member of ours, uh, Dennis Riley. I, I'm fairly humbled to actually be standing here talking about Dennis because I've only been here three years and he's already a legend to me. And so I had no idea, but, but his reputation has gotten around. I wanted to give you a few stats on uh, Dennis' uh, background. Um, he gave me this big, long thing to read <laughs> off, but I it distilled it down to a couple of high points. I hope you didn't Thanks. mind that. No, I, I, I don't mind that. No. Um, he got his BA at Willamette University, uh, his MPA from Syracuse University. Go Orange! I'm Go that's Orange, your driver, yeah. by the way. And the PhD from the University of Michigan. His teaching has uh, consisted of work at Gonzaga University, at the University of Minnesota Duluth, and here at Stevens Point since 1978. And he said that there are a few faculty members in the audience who precede him. I'm looking at Richard. And a few others that apparently precede him. Yes, there's a few of them around. Uh, right, there you go. Um, Dennis has received the University uh, Excellence Award in Teaching in 1980 and in 1998, twice here at this university. He was voted the be best professor on campus in a UWSP pointer online poll in 2009. In 2009. That's, yeah. I'm not sure. Is that a suspicious poll or you're a... <laughs> all I'll say is one of my advisees counted the votes. That's all Official, I'm going to say. Officially sanctioned, I'm sure. Oh, oh yeah. Other awards Dennis has received at the Eugene Katz Award, Distinguished Professor of Letters and Science in 2007, just before I got here. He has major publications uh, with Temple University Press controlling the federal bureaucracy. Uh, another publication, uh, a book, Public Personnel Administration from HarperCollins, 1993. Public Personnel Administration uh, from Longman Press, 2002. Bureaucracy and the Policy Process. Roman and Littlefield, 2006, uh, which he co-authored uh, with a colleague in, in the poli-sci department. Um, there have been many assorted pieces in journals, many other private awards that didn't occur through the university, uh, which would take me a long, long time to go through, but I decided just to distill it out into a few things. He's a frequent guest commentator on Wisconsin Public Radio and occasional commentator on local media, contributes a monthly column on politics, for a magazine titled Central Wisconsin um, Hoopia. Hoop La. Hoop La, excuse like, me. You know. Central Wisconsin Hoop La. <laughs> Just never this mind. is what happens when your printer drops an L into an I. So, having said that, if you want to find Dennis and his dear wife Pam on a Friday afternoon, you need to go to Amherst, Wisconsin and look at the north at the southwest corner of the bar in the Central Waters Brewery. He has what is known as an endowed beer stool <laughs> at the Central Waters Brewery. I'm, I'm truly humbled and honored uh, to introduce a true treasure of the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, Professor Dennis Riley. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. All right. <clears throat> Well, as I learned uh, more than half a century ago, I learned to say this phrase. It's Willamette, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, enough of that, but it is. I mean, it's not my fault. Willamette's in Illinois. Anyhow, um, I have been asked to read the following to all of you before I start any of this stuff. A telecoil loop system is installed in the pinery room. If you wear a hearing aid, Please turn on the telecoil adjustment to receive amplified sound for your background noise. In addition, there are two headset receivers, right over there, that can be used with the telecoil loop system available, well, it says available at the circulation desk, but Vicki brought them right in there. Feel free. Uh, that's, that's one of these cord, sort of dangling cords, is the microphone for the telecoil system. The other one is the microphone for the recording system. So, I, I think I was in Ann Arbor the last time I had somebody pin a mic on me that wasn't for television or radio or something, but that's okay. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm 
you know, it, it's always kind of fun. I like doing this, I think, although it's the first time I've looked down at notes for a lecture that I haven't given 15 or 20 times. And it's a little scary, actually, as I learned, what, what did I mean by that? Well, we're going to find out what I think I meant by that in a moment. But I also have to, to thank uh, Chris for that marvelous introduction. Um, pretty much every faculty member, somewhere along the line, on his or her bucket list, writes, generous introduction from a dean. <laughs> OK, now I can cross that one. I wonder what else is on it. <laughs> well, it must be something else on it. Anyway, here, here we go. Um, I, I usually, you know, when I introduce myself to my classes at the beginning of a semester, I tell them that they're about to step back into the way college was in the 1960s. Nothing. There's no technology of any kind. And then what happens? It's being taped. It, I got microphones sticking on my lapels. I got stuff in my pockets. It's still going to just be a straight lecture. I don't know how to use anything else. So, you know, all I do is stand here and talk for 45 minutes or so and then take some questions from you. So I probably ought to get started on precisely that. So here goes. I want to try to do three things if I can over the next 45 minutes. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about a framework for understanding elections that we can then take forward into the second part, which is what is happening to us <laughs> and what has been happening since this election season got started, which is sometime oh, a day or two after Barack Obama was sworn in as President of the United States. This election season has been going on. What has been happening in this election season? And then last, um, I'd like to, to take just five minutes at the end or so to talk about what might happen after this election is over. But um, unfortunately, it will be more about what won't happen rather than what might happen. But let me talk about that uh, kind of framework. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a theory. It's not, nothing fancy as that. But it's just kind of a framework, a set of concepts that I use to understand elections. Um, the, the first, and everybody knows this, but, but you sort of have to have them all laid out. Elections are about voters. Now, there is an entire circus train of people who think they know how to convince voters to do what they want them to do. And they all get paid fairly well, generally speaking. Uh, candidates don't get paid all that well, but they usually have plenty of money to sustain themselves, so it's not much of a problem. I mean, you've got candidates and, and political operatives and party people and media people, and you know, just that, that whole circus train is full. But in the end, it always comes down to the voters. And so we want to try to understand a little bit about what goes on in the heads, or wherever it is that voters process information these days heads, we hope, that, that what goes on there, what are the things that come in, and we'll talk about that, I'm going to talk about that in, in just a moment. But the other two things that we'll also get to, uh, elections are about voters. Elections are simultaneously about the past and the future. They're not about one or the other, they're about the past or the future. How much they're about the past versus how much they're about the future is up for grabs. We don't know from one election to the next what it's going to be like. And the circus train is full of people who want to convince voters this is an election about the past or this is an election about the future or whatever. But it is about either the past or the future, a little bit of both. But voters, again, kind of decide which one. And they're pretty unpredictable about that. Or where on the continuum between mostly past and mostly future they, they fall. And then the last thing, elections are partisan. There's no getting away from that. Might be nice to sometimes, but there's no getting away from it. They're partisan affairs. They've been organized by political parties ever since the, the early 1800s. And there's not much that's ever going to happen about that. And the partisan nature of them is a very important part of what we're going to see. But again, it's on a continuum. Some elections are intensely partisan, meaning they're base elections, meaning everybody goes to their corner and we count. But some elections are less partisan. No elections are nonpartisan. Not even the nonpartisan ones are nonpartisan. <laughs> we can't figure out how to do that. Come on, we, we really just can't do that. But, but they're less partisan, OK? Uh, if you were to think, for example, of, of this year's election, or you think of 2008's election, 
2008's election was probably less partisan than 2004's. But if you were to compare it to a less partisan election from the 50s, like 52 and 56, no, this is a, 2008 was a pretty partisan election relative to 52 and 56. So it, it, it's changed. The partisanship continuum has shrunk. You can't get a less partisan election of the type when Eisenhower won, when nobody knew if he was a Republican or a Democrat and they didn't really much give a damn. He was Ike, that was fine. Okay, he's a Republican. So they returned into office with huge majorities for the Democrats uh, in, in, when he ran for re-election. So, so they think they can be less or more. Well, all right, we know those three things. Now let's go back to the voters. Uh, voters, the way I think of them, voters, when they're getting ready to think about what they're going to do, am I gonna vote, who am I gonna vote for, voters are sort of standing under or sitting under, depending on how energetic they are at the moment, three thought bubbles. You know, I, was, if I, I started out with voices in their heads and I thought, no, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I really don't want to go there. I, I can still picture a student of ours many years, not of ours, but on the campus many years ago, who wore a black t-shirt, a black hat, and black jeans. And the t-shirt said, I only do what the voices in my head tell me to do. And I gave that guy a wide berth every time I saw him. I go, well, I really wasn't going to go there anyway. I was going to go over here. So I got rid of the voices in the head and went to the thought bubbles. You know, that's as best I can do. But there are three, I think. And, and one of them is, is what I would call the substantive thought bubble. What's bothering me? Why do I think that I really even want to bother to vote? What are the issues that concern me? But beyond the issues that concern me, you know, what, what should we do about Iran possibly getting a nuclear weapon? What should we do about legalizing gay marriage everywhere and, and get it over with? And the Defense of Marriage Act, and getting rid of that, not just not enforcing it, but getting rid of it. Um, you know, those kinds of things, issues that people are concerned about. But also in the substantive bubble are values and maybe even ideology that help make sense out of those issues and give some sort of direction to them when somebody's thinking about voting. So you got a substantive bubble hanging up over your head, but everybody has a candidate bubble. We rarely vote on the substance of things. We vote for candidates, for people, for human beings that we hope will do the things that we really want to have done. So we've got that kind of candidate bubble floating around up there. And then we've got a party bubble. It's if you're gonna vote, in the end, in the crunch, if you're gonna vote, you're probably gonna vote for one of the two major political parties. And most people come to grips with that and know that's what they're gonna to have to do. So when people look at the partisan bubble, they see Democrat, Republican, Independent. There's lots of other parties you could vote for, but most people don't even know they exist. Once in a great while, there is a Green Party and some people will vote for the Green Party. There's the Libertarian Party, and some people will vote for that. But for the most part, if you want to influence the outcome, you're pretty well stuck with the Republicans and the Democrats. But the independent business is there. Well, what, what tends to happen, a lot of Americans are either Democrats or Republicans. And by that, I don't mean they belong to the county party and contribute money and go to the meetings and do the things that, that some people do. Otherwise, we wouldn't have political parties. We couldn't hold them together but that they, they belong in, in some kind of psychological sense, okay? This is who I usually vote for, and this is why, and I'm, I'm okay with that. So when I look in the mirror and I see a donkey head looking back at me, I'm not appalled by it, you know? That's just kind of who I am. Or see a Republican head looking back at me, an, an elephant head. Okay, fine. Um, there are other people who, who, you know, latch onto the independent idea, but basically when they look in the mirror, they see either a donkey or an elephant. They're not happy about that because they think of themselves as independents, but they really see a donkey or an elephant because if you push them hard enough, it turns out they do almost always vote for one or the other of the two political parties. Call themselves independents, but that's not how they, they do things. But there are genuine independents who don't usually, you know, don't have one party preference over the other most of the time, but they're an interesting bunch because some of them look in the mirror and they see a unicorn. And it really is a unicorn. 
You know, that's the neat part about it. It really is a unicorn. But a lot of people who are independents look in the mirror and they see a unicorn, but it's actually a small horse with a horn taped on, you know, with duct tape. But they don't, they, they don't know that because it's comforting not to say that. There are, in other words, people who genuinely are independents and actually do the independent myth. They really look at the candidates, they look at the parties, they think it over carefully, they can't stay with one over the other and they make their decisions and issues flow through their heads. But we also have the low information voters who often call themselves independents but really don't have much of an idea what's going on. So the partisan bubble is kind of funny looking too. Well, okay, the big thing and three big things that, that complicate this for the voter tremendously. First of all, inside each thought bubble, it's not, it, those are things that we put in our own thought bubbles. We put them there and we interpret what they mean and they are our sort of perceptions of things. If you were to think, the, the one that occurred to me earlier today, if your thought bubble has the number $716 billion in it, and it might, a lot of folks want that to be in your thought bubble, but what do you attach to that in your thought bubble? Is that the money that Paul Ryan wants to steal from Medicare to give to rich people in tax cuts? Is that what it is? Is it the money that Barack Obama stole from Medicare for his unconstitutional health care plan? Is it the $716 billion that Mitt Romney swears he will keep in Medicare so all of its current beneficiaries will be just absolutely fine? Or is it the $716 billion that the president believes he got by saying to Medicare providers, and particularly the insurance companies that provide Medicare supplements, okay, you guys have been taking this long enough. Hand some of it back and we're gonna give you in exchange for that a whole lot of new patients, a whole lot of new insurance policies. So back off and we're gonna do that. Well, which, what, what, what is that $716 billion? In this election context, it's each one of those just for different folks. So what's in the thought bubble you put there, it's your perceptions of things, and there's all, that's where people are really working on you to try to convince you that this is what you should attach to that number in your thought bubble. And in candidate thought bubbles, it's the same way. We put things in there. You know, it's kind of become a cliche that what we want in a president is somebody we'd like to go out and have a beer with. Mm -hmm. eh. You know, there's a lot of people I would like to go out and have a beer with that I don't particularly want to have be president because I wouldn't want to do that to them. They're such decent people. I don't want to grind them down like that. You know, I don't want to wear them out. They're, I want them to be around. So I don't want to do it, It's more complicated than the beer test, but there is a candidate test too. And, and each of us, again, puts in the thought bubble what we think ought to be there. I think compassion has got to be there, and if it's not, I don't want this guy. Or woman, I don't want anybody that isn't compassionate.